During his 10 years as a performer, Robert Houdin became world famous for his magic, but his popularity made other magicians jealous. They wanted to learn his tricks. They were willing to pay him for the secrets to the tricks, but Robert Houdin wasn't about to sell his secrets because then everyone could do what he did. That would ruin his career. Unfortunately, Robert Houdin's refusal to sell didn't stop others from doing everything they could to get access to his secrets, even if it involved breaking the law. One of Robert Houdin's rivals was a man named John Henry Anderson. He was a magician from Scotland who taught himself the great wizard of the North. While Robert Houdin was Becoming popular on the European continent, Anderson was building his own theatres in England and Scotland and travelling with his act to North America and Australia. Anderson was a smart businessman and the first magician to really understand the value of advertising. He created posters and placed ads in newspapers to announce he would be performing in local towns. These advertisements promised readers they would use amazing things they had never seen before. Anderson was always true his, to his word and his advertisements. His magic was something most people had never seen before and would probably never see again. For example, one trick he performed was come to known as the bullet catch, which is one of the most dangerous magic tricks ever performed. It is still done today, and it is still extremely dangerous. In this trick, Anderson asked a member of the audience to fire a pistol at his head, claiming that he would catch the speeding bullet with his teeth. This trick made audience excited nervous and scared all at the same time. There was there were reports that some people fainted from fear at the possibility of seeing someone die on stage. Yet each time the trigger was pulled, the bullet ended up safely in Anderson's teeth. Audience gaps in the relief before applauding wildly. The Great Wizard of the North was also the first magician to Advertise a trick that has since come to define magic, pulling a rabbit out of a hat. No one is certain whether Anderson invented the trick, but he made it one of the most popular conjuring tricks of all time. Anderson had begun performing before Robert Houdin and, and was initially more famous, but after traveling the world for several years, he returned to England to find that people were talking about how Robert Houdin was. Anderson must have been quite disappointed, but not for long. In a surprising turn of events, Anderson started performing tricks Robert Houdin had created for his own act. Tricks supposedly, supposedly only Robert Houdin knew the secrets to. Something nasty had become part of the magic business. Magicians against magicians. In the years ahead, magicians would frequently accuse one another of stealing tricks. Honest magicians started going to court to protect their secrets. While this honest magician would do almost anything to steal a trick, they would bribe assistants to tell them how a trick was done or hire spies to sneak into a theater and examine equipment. To them, all, the, all that method was having the latest and greatest magic as part of their show. Robert Houdin found that one of his assistants, a man who helped him build his devices, had secretly made copies of his plans and sold them to other magicians. It is possible that Anderson got these plans and used them to create an act that competed directly with Robert Houdin's. While double-crossing assistants were usually at the root of 
one magician gaining access to another's tricks. Some performers delighted in openly exposing other secrets. One incredibly successful magician of the 1800s got his start in magic by showing how other magicians did their tricks. His name was John Neville Mastelin. He was born in England in 1839 and, similar to Robert Houdin, had worked as a watchmaker as a young man. Marcelin didn't start his magic career intending to reveal the stage antics of performing magicians. Initially, he delighted in exposing the tricks of people called spiritualists. These men and women and even some children claimed to have the power to communicate with ghosts and the spirit world. They would sit in rooms or auditoriums and allow themselves to be blindfolded tied to chairs or locked in large cabinets. Then the room would be darkened and the spiritualists would pretend they were talking to dead people. Mysterious sounds like bang on the wall or blaring trumpets would fill the darkened room and frighten the audience. Since the spiritualists were tied or locked up, no one could figure out who or what was making all the strange noise. The spectators believed that these spiritualists had contact with the dead, and the most famous spiritualist stunt was known as the Magic Cabinet. It was made famous in the mid-1800s by Davenport Brothers. Two early American spiritualists in front of an audience Ira and William Henry Davenport was tied up inside a seemingly normal cabinet and the doors were closed. The lights in the room were dimmed. Suddenly, strange illuminated hands were seen reaching out from a hole in the cabinet, accompanied by bizarre knocking sounds and music. When the noise stopped, the lights were turned on. When the cabinet was opened, the Davenport's were still tied up. The brothers claimed that while they were tied up, in not spirits had made all the noise. The magic cabinet were very simple devices. Almost all magic cabinets, even those used today, were based on two things, a false bag that swung open like a door and set of mirrors. With a false bag, people could climb in and out of the box without the audience seeing them, as long as the front doors were closed. The mirrors were a little trickier to manage. Magicians and spiritualists used precise geometric calculation to position mirrors at an angle inside the cabinet in such a way that anyone looking at an open cabinet would see a reflection of the inside walls of the cabinet the members of the audience could not see themselves or anything else reflected. So the cabinet looked like an empty cabinet right up to moments the Davenport steps inside of it. The mirrors helped conceal the false doors and props needed to make the trick work. It was a good trick, although the Davenports would not admit it was a trick. And from the 1850s to the 1870s, people, f people fell for it. Marcelin delighted in showing his audiences. There was nothing supernatural about the spiritualist did. They were just very clever magicians who could untie themselves quickly in the dark. making lots of noise while moving around in the stage, including taking a quick blow on a horn and retire themselves before the lights come back on. Marceline gained fame by duplicating their spiritualist tricks in public, showing how they could untie themselves or be let out of the cabinet. This exposure infuriated the spiritualists 
and their audiences disappeared after their fraud was exposed. Having successfully revealed the secrets of the spiritualists, Mastelin began to create tricks of his own. He took over a small theater in London called the Egyptian Hall. There he constructed a show based on his own version of the magic cabinet. For his trick, a person entered the cabinet, actually a small closet, and then disappeared. Or someone else appeared in the closet on his or her behalf, and he did it on a lighted stage, not in the darkened room. To make the act more interesting, he created fanciful stories and dramatic plays with exotic themes that led up to someone's disappearing in the cabinet. Masterlin's illusion was helped by the fact that the theatres were dark and smoky. Nonetheless, by the end of the 19th century, other smart magicians had figured out how to build their own magic cabinets. This upset Masterlin to no end, and he went to court several times to protect his version of the cabinet. But then it was too late for his act. Most of his competitors knew the secret, and they had started using it. Hurt by all the copycats, Marceline was determined to create something no one else could copy. The success of his theater depended on it. He settled on the idea of making objects levitate. Marceline had seen other magicians make objects such as brooms and silverware float in the air. He knew that thin black wires were used to make these objects drift across the stage. These tricks were audience favorites because no one could see the black wires. Levitation was interesting, but the objects themselves were boring. What if it could make a person float through the air? Maslin wondered. He believed it would be the most remarkable trick in history, but an average person weighed more than a hundred pounds. That would be much more difficult than making a bottle of broom or a bouquet of roses float around. Lifting something as heavy as a young man or woman would require lots of machinery. Marceline set about creating the illusion after many months of preparation. In 1897, he unveiled a play called Trapped by Magic, which ended with the levitation of a man who rose off the stage. To make sure no one thought the man was suspended by the lines of the man's body, proving that he was floating by, thin by himself, in later shows, Maslin improved his levitation trick by having the floating person move around the stage. The, le the levitation trick invented by Maslin is one of the most all inspiration tricks in all magic. You and I know that people can't float in the air. It's impossible. Gravity does not allow heavy objects like a human body to rise off the ground. The only way something heavy can be lifted into the air is if something is lifting it or is pushing it upward. And just because a magician's machinery can be seen by the audience doesn't mean it is not there. Making someone levitate is a good example of a trick that must be done on stage. You won't see the trick. You won't see a street performer levitating a spectator because it requires special equipment that would be seen outside in the sunlight. This equipment includes simple dev devices such as pulleys and thin wires covered with paint so they won't shine and very sophisticated machineries that can push a body upwards using metal poles. The machinery made Marceline's trick possible was so complicated it had dozens and dozens of wires coming up from the floor and down from the ceiling. 
that it took a lot, a long time before any other magicians figured out how he did it. Marcelin had the most successful show in all England for many years. He eventually employed other magicians to take part of a traveling show that performed in other countries while Marcelin was in England. Mirrors are very important because of the way they make our eyes believe we are seeing something that isn't really there. The first mirrors used in magic were actually large pieces of glass used to show human spirits floating on stage. It was a simple illusion and one you can demonstrate in your own house. Try this. On a dark night, look out of the window of your bedroom or living room with the lights on inside. What do you see? You don't mm -hmm. see trees or telephone poles or parked cars outside. You see your own reflection. This is because the light from inside your house is reflecting off the glass and the reflected image is brighter than the objects out in the dark night. This same principle was used for early magic shows to create the illusion of ghosts and spirits. The audience would sit in front of the stage, looking up at the magician. A very clean sheet of glass was placed across part of the stage, which the audience couldn't see. As lights were lowered on the stage, the tilted glass would reflect the images of the magician's helpers who were in the orchestra pit. The audience wouldn't see these people down below because of the raised front wall of the stage. Up on the stage, it wouldn't look like these people were floating in the air as their images reflected upward to the tilted glass. As the magician walked behind the glass, it looked like he was walking right through the spirits. No matter who is doing it, levitation requires machinery or a very sturdy prop. In Marceline's day, wires were used to suspend the person being levitated. Today, everything from wires to mechanical lifts are used. Yet, with the right tools and supervision, this trick can be done by almost anyone. Here's a look at a simple levitation table that works perfectly well but doesn't have any moving parts. Note that the placement of the curtain, which covers the strut supporting the table, is crucial to making the trick look realistic. The same is true for the sawhorse supports. They don't do anything except provide the illusion that they are holding the table up. In fact, they are barely touching the table. Also, the magician has to walk around the table as if nothing is blocking his way. This makes it appear as if nothing is supporting the table other than the sawhorse. Once the assistant is on the table, the magician leans over, appearing to hypnotize or convey the powers to the assistant. This leaning adds to the effect that there is nothing in the magician's path. That is, after this mag magical transference, the magician removes the sawhorse one at a time and the table is left floating. The magician waves his hand over and under the table, being careful not to bump the support. Once it's proved that the table is floating, the magician replaces the sawhorses and helps the assistant off the table, and the trick is completed.